know um, if some of the other sessions are a guide. It, it, for me, it took a little while before I joined. So I'm just going to give it another couple of seconds here before we get started. Um, my name is Dave Peloff. Uh, I was on this morning at 8.45. Some of you may have been there. If you have, if you were there, <laughs> congratulations. It's been a long day. Um, a really good day, though. Um, I've been at Hopkins for, I think, 23 years now, um, all at the Center for Technology and Education, um, mostly leading a team that builds software for education and uh, data systems for education, assessment, research. They also let me teach once in a while. Um, but one thing I've learned from working at Hopkins for so long is sometimes it's best to just shut up and listen because uh, you're surrounded by really smart people. And that's kind of how I felt today. Uh, all day long, I think I learned something in every session. Took a lot of good notes. Um, we talked about community, technology, health and science, business, government, education, um, supply chain. It was, it was really phenomenal. And I wanna thank the people at TAME who put this on. Um, I know I got a lot out of it. <clears throat> um, what I would like to do in this last session is get some input from you about things that you learned, um, starting with the question of what do you see as some of the silver linings in this pandemic that we have been experiencing? Um, what are some of the lasting positive impacts? Um, you know, there's always a lot of focus on, on the negative with these things, understandably trying to reckon with what's happening to us. But I did hear a lot of interesting things today and over the past few months uh, that are changing for the better as a result of this kind of, of impetus. Um, a few things that come to mind while you're thinking, and then I'd like, if you don't mind, to start filling in this chat room with any comments you have about things that you see as silver linings in all this. <clears throat> a couple of things that I noticed. Um, the, the phrase, never let a good crisis go to waste. I think that was in um, Ella Hood's presentation where she was quoting Winston Churchill. That's that's powerful to take something like this and figure out how it can help, how it can push us forward, how it can help us innovate, to think differently, to solve problems. So I love that. Um, another quote I heard um, was how to, to get comfortable being uncomfortable, which was actually a, um, I believe a US Navy SEAL motto, if I'm not mistaken, but it has also been used more recently in a TED talk by Levi Ajayi, who calls herself a professional troublemaker. Um, the idea of getting comfortable with, with discomfort, and, and that's particularly true, I think, with the protests that are going on in the country right now. Um, don't try to make it okay. Don't try to make it comfortable. It's okay that it's not, and, and reckon with it. Um, specifically about the pandemic and some of the things I heard today. We heard about a drop in pollution levels. That's pretty cool. Um, it reminded me of a book I read a long time ago called The World Without Us. If you haven't read that, it's fascinating. It's just a theoretical experiment of what happens if humans just disappeared off the face of the earth and how the environment would respond. <clears throat> Not just the environment either, how our, our buildings and our railroads and our subways and everything that we created on this earth, what would happen to it and how long it would take before all evidence of us is basically gone. Uh, wait, sorry, we're talking about good news here, but, um, but that's a good book. Um, there's, there's been, I think, a really strong understand, better understanding of public health in society. Um, at least just from what I've noticed, people are taking a much stronger interest in learning um, about the intricacies of this virus, how it is, how it is spread, um, 
what people can do. How, how can we prevent something like this in the future? Clearly, we weren't prepared, even though there was a lot of work that went into preparing us for this. Uh, it did not play out as it should have, but I'm optimistic that we've learned a lot and that in the future, when this happens again, we will be. Um, there's been a lot of optimism for me in seeing it how um, the consistent trust and the people like Dr. Fauci, you know, they're, they're, they're listening to him and people are actually behaving in a way that makes this whole thing better. Um, and that's, I won't, I won't talk about the other side of that equation, but um, people can handle bad news. It's, it's sometimes better than, than happy talk. It's, it's good to hear the truth. People can deal with it and, and um, address it. Uh, a couple other things. Um, we're not wasting time on commuting, which is great. I know for me that means more time reading. Uh, my younger daughter, who has never been a big reader, is on her fourth book during this quarantine, which is great. Um, there's going to be less stigma for working at home. So all around some of these benefits about less traffic, less pollution, I think could be permanent. It's possible. Um, the improvements in telemedicine, oh, that's fantastic that that is being better accepted by both providers and consumers. There was a fascinating article in the Washington Post recently about therapy in the age of COVID and how uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, therapists who have been doing video lessons were very worried, not lessons, sessions, who have been very worried about how it would go are actually finding it to be really powerful because they're getting a glimpse into, into the person's home life. They're seeing their kids for the first time. They're seeing their home. They're seeing a musical instrument in the background that they never knew the person played. Uh, and the reverse is true. They, the patient is seeing more about their, their doctor, their therapist. And so there's an intimacy to it that wasn't expected, which I found uh, really fascinating, these unintended consequences. Um, and finally, just kind of the idea that there's these innovative thinkers who are at home and maybe have some more time than they would have otherwise, who are dreaming up solutions to big problems. Um, I think about all of these Rube Goldberg machines that you see posted on Twitter and Instagram, uh, where these people are creating the most unbelievable machines just for fun. And you, you just know that, that those people and others are using this time to think about creative solutions to big world problems. So that makes me optimistic. One of my colleagues, uh, Jenna Rose, is on with me right now, and she's going to help with the, uh, the comments. So do we have anything, Jenna Rose, you want to we bring up? We have a few things. Um, Jin Chong says people are, as one of the positives, people are finding different ways of staying connected. Um, and then Giselle Patton says a few things, forced awareness of inequities, opportunity to hit the reset button and creative ways to find solutions and new business opportunities. And maybe you wanna just speak to that. Absolutely. So first of all, new ways of staying connected. I mean. I know we keep hitting this whole idea of Zoom, but for me personally, it's it's not only saved uh, how we work together in my day job, it's saved the class that I taught and not just Zoom, other, other platforms as well. Um, and it's also, believe it or not, brought me personally closer to family members. We've been having a weekly Zoom, some of the older family members who you know, are, are very afraid, understandably, to go out at all, haven't even been to the grocery store, and we're doing kind of weekly check-ins, um, family Zoom chats, and that's been another unintended, unintended very positive uh, consequence. Um, Giselle, forced awareness of inequities, absolutely, particularly as Linda Carling talked about in this morning in her keynote, uh, how we have to really look at the children who are going through this who haven't been participating in school at all. 
uh, for various reasons. Either they don't have the technology, they haven't had the uh, parental support they need. Um, it could be many, and, and students with disabilities who, who might be not being served and the way they should be during this. So I do, I think that's a critical point, Giselle. And the opportunity to hit the reset button, to think about, you know, take stock of where we are, who we are, what we're trying to do. Um, think about our mission and our work, what's important. Um, I remember hearing something the other day about uh, how people are blissful uh, optimism or something like that. It's the idea of, no, blissful productivity. It's the idea that people are actually happier when they're working hard at something that they care about. So I thought, I found that really interesting. You know, you think about happiness as being relaxing and kicking back, but studies have shown people are actually happier when they're doing something, they're staying busy doing something they care about. Um, let's see, uh, Jenna Rose, do you want to talk about Linda's comment? Sure. I'm actually, you know, for a hot second, I'm going to pass Please. right to Linda's comment because she was the keynote speaker um, and had a lot of great things to say. We will get to that in one second, but I see that Benamon um, has said as a positive silver lining, many people have suffered and lost their lives, but we have confirmed that there are fundamental weaknesses in various parts of the system, especially the food security issue, poor access to healthcare. And we have been given an amazing chance to prevent and or get ready for other crises, especially climate change. Ah, oh, absolutely. I love that. No, there's huge reason to be optimistic uh, about all of those things. Um, my wife is, is a scientist and uh, she works for the company AstraZeneca. And so I've, I've been privy to some of their conversations. And what, what I've seen and what she's seen is that a lot of these companies who don't necessarily have anything specific to gain financially from this crisis are still turning massive amounts of resources to helping to solve it. Now, there's understandable skepticism about the pharmaceutical industry, uh, but there are a lot of people who are smart people, science, health, who are turning their attention to this uh, that will help us in the future. I don't personally know a ton about the food security issue, but I know it's critical. Um, my daughter is on her way to pick up our carry out food tonight and it always makes me nervous. Although so far everything has been good. Um, but it's, it's really important that we keep that in mind going forward. And then, yeah, just the whole idea of climate change and how we can look at the data now to see with this, with the shutdown in place, with the less manufacturing, with less pollution in the air, we can see really tangible data about what's happening. Um, there's every reason to think that that will be positively used to influence the argument going forward. <clears throat> Jenna okay. Rose, what, what's next? Sure, so from Linda Carling, who we saw this morning. Thank you, Linda. I saw a theme from the day of the many opportunities that can come from this pandemic. I'm reminded of the theory of transformational learning where disorienting dilemmas have the potential to cause the biggest transformation in thinking and beliefs. My audio cut out for one second there. I'm sorry. Oh, let me reread that for you. For the Please. Beginning. I saw a theme from the day of the many opportunities that can come from this pandemic. I'm reminded of the theory of transformational learning where disorienting dilemmas have the potential to cause the biggest transformation in thinking and beliefs. No, absolutely. Chaos often leads to major advances. I mean, it goes back to the, the Churchill quote, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, transformational learn, the theory of transformational learning, the idea that when big things happen, you're forced to adjust. Um, that's absolutely happening right now. And some of the best things that are happening will stick around. There's no doubt about that. We're still in the middle of it. So it, it's, it, I find it personally hard to 
have context for some of these things. I'm still in some ways reeling about every day there's there's something new that we're we're understanding, reckoning with, trying to decide. Um, but when we step back from all of this, which we will at some point, there's going to be a great opportunity for, for learning about we want, what we went through here. <clears throat> um, Lynn Manzer, as, as strange as this time is, there seems to be a hopeful, positive energy for advancing into the unknown. Absolutely. I, f I definitely feel the positivity um, at work. We have a, a staff that I'm, I've been so proud of how everyone has responded, how everyone has been looking at this as a way to make things better. Um, no one is and it happened right away in, in my experience. It didn't, it didn't even take much time before people turned on a dime and said, hey, we need to make the best of this. We need to learn from this. We need to help the kids that are going through this. We need to start thinking about the kids with special needs, underserved kids. I mean, that's our area, that's our missions, our center's mission is to help all children, particularly those that have special needs, special circumstances. And if there was ever a time for that mission to be important, it's now. What's next, Generous? Okay, so we have one more um, silver lining, and that's from Jackie Nunn. And she said, I like, what I like most was the idea of mo moving hazardous manufacturing into space. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was a good one. I enjoyed that one too. Um, and also just some of the science about medicine and what they're learning about in terms of uh, studying the, uh, the astronauts and, and how they use telemedicine with the astronauts um, and all the things. I, I, I don't think I had ever realized how just how much we've learned from the space program um, that never gets talked about. Just all the experiments small and large that have led to technologies and medical advances, scientific understanding. Um, yeah, the space program has added a ton to our understanding of the world. Um, another question, feel free to add more silver linings if you think of them. Um, I'm curious if there's anything that you will personally do differently based on what you learned today, any direct impact of what you heard from the speakers that might lead you to change some kind of behavior or to pursue some topic or some business opportunity or some area, area of interest that you would not have otherwise. Um, I see we have about 17 people in the chat. I'd love to hear from some of you, even if it's just quick, short bursts. Because as the introvert, as I explained this morning, I get my energy from being alone. <laughs> and this is weird for me, but I, I'm just kidding, I'm enjoying it. Um, engaging in more virtual conferences, absolutely. Honestly, I think some of us may have been at least a little bit skeptical, not skeptical, but wondering how this would all work, how how the how it would feel to go to this kind of conference maybe some of you have already done it i haven't um but i've been in, in in these sessions pretty much all day long one to the next and i found it pretty exhilarating I, when i go to conferences i often frankly burn out about halfway through the day um, that hasn't happened to me i can get up and i can walk to the kitchen and get something to eat i can walk outside and come right back so I personally found the format to be kind of interesting and exciting. What else do you see there, Generous? Oh, Joyce Betancourt says, yes, it would be great to have more collective events like this online, which is sort of just what you said. Then I put in my own piece, <laughs> which uh, says the access that the virtual world gives to some people with disabilities. Um, some friends of mine actually have mentioned um, you know, with limited mobility or anxiety issues, et cetera, um, how this as a sort of hybrid form of education might, you know, 
might be something that we want to keep going on with going forward. Absolutely. Um, We've got Jackie Nunn and she said, I want to reflect on the notion of reviewing assumptions in our organization that are getting old. And Carla Bass says, it helped me to further put the situation into perspective and see how risk management can still apply despite the complexity. Yeah. No, there's some interesting stuff about risk management. One thing I really liked about this conference was just how varied the topics were, which is, um, in my experience, somewhat unusual. Um, there wasn't just one prevailing theme throughout, other than the fact that we're all dealing with this uh, pandemic, which ties it all together in interesting ways. Uh, but I, I loved hearing some of the the topics uh, that I know very little about. And if if that kind of conference, could, if this kind of conference could be a model for that in the future, um, I think that's that's fantastic. Um, one thing I heard, I don't remember if it was who said it, or maybe it was a comment, but the idea of teaching kids the importance of mindfulness during all of this. You know, it's, there are a lot of people out there who are struggling with this quarantine in different ways. Um, I've been fortunate to have a family here with me, not everyone does. And there are a lot of young kids who are really missing the social interaction. Um, a big part of schooling and I see my the two boys across the street from me outside playing basketball nine hours a day I mean it's they're out there constantly just trying to burn off the energy they're, luckily they have a brother so that the two of them are playing together but I can just imagine um, how some kids are struggling with this and one one potential approach is to look at teaching kids about meditation, mindfulness, uh, understanding how to control their emotions in that way. I thought that was a really interesting point. What else do you see? I don't have my glasses on, so it's hard to see the chat. Sure, I am your eyes. Uh, there are no further comments at this time, but we're at 7-Eleven, so we're pretty good. Okay. Close. Well, and the, and the dogs didn't bark. I was going to save... Uh, I assumed they bark at everything that comes by, so I was going to say the big winners in this pandemic, if there is one, it's the world's dogs, because they have been, <laughs> they have had every moment with us for the past few months, pretty much. So there is one that's another silver lining, I suppose, for the canine kingdom. Um, thank you very much for inviting us to be part of this, the Center for Technology and Education. We really appreciate it. Um, I hope some of what we brought to it helped, but uh, mostly we appreciate being able to listen and, um, and learn from it. Thank you to the conference organizers. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much for John Hopkins University. Um, we've made it through, it's been 11 hours, 42 speakers. Um, yeah, and we're super excited to share the content with everybody uh, afterwards in terms of the recordings. So thank you so much. Okay, great. Be safe, everybody. You too. Bye.